Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, how good it is to know you as our Savior and Lord. And I pray if there's anyone here today who is not trusting you, Father, that you would nudge them by your spirit as your word goes forth and draw them to you. We thank you, Father, for these that are gathered here. And we just pray, that, Lord, that our lives might reflect your grace as we live them each day. Father, you know there are many that have particular needs. Some are physical, some are spiritual. Father, we pray that you administer to those needs, and we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's share together from God's Word this morning. I'm going to be sharing from an Old Testament passage on a question that I think that we need to think about for ourselves. Are you a good steward? Are you a good steward? Some of you may say, well, I didn't know I was a steward. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of places, you know, you're, they select, quote, stewards. But did you know that all of us are really stewards? Stewards. What is a good steward? Well, in the Bible... A steward is someone who manages and uses God's gifts in a responsible way. Stewardship is about being grateful and generous with these gifts and recognizing that everything we have comes from God. Wikipedia offers this description of stewardship, and I think it's a pretty fair one. Stewardship is utilizing and managing all resources God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of His creation. Be honest with you, I'm sort of surprised that Wikipedia even had that and had that down. It went on to write: the central essence of biblical worldview stewardship is managing everything God brings into the believer's life in a manner that honors God and impacts. Eternity. In First Chronicles, which we're going to be sharing from, in particular chapter 29, but I want us to lead up to that, we find the account of the plans that David had in mind for building the Old Testament temple. And I think it really offers to us a good example of stewardship. David tells us in the 28th chapter that the Holy Spirit put into the heart and mind of him, his heart and mind, for the plans and construction of the temple, the work serving in the temple, and for all the articles that were to be used in the service. Now, David's God given vision to build this magnificent structure for the worship of the Lord God. Listen to what he says King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God, and I made plans to build it. And just just so that uh, everybody is on the same page, the Ark, of course, was where uh, the Ark was placed. It had the Ten Commandments in it and some other articles we read about in the New Testament book of Hebrews. And that Ark was placed in the temple in the old tabernacle, which was a tent 
structure that God had prescribed during the time of Moses. And they, they placed it in a, what they called the most holy place. And that place where the ark was, one day, one day out of a year, the high priest would go in and he would sprinkle blood of a sacrifice on that altar for an atonement, that is to make an offering for the sins of the people. And of course, all of those Old Testament sacrifices were what we read about in the New Testament were but shadows of the reality of Christ who would be the Lamb of God and who would provide the shed blood that would cover our sins. Now David, he got to thinking and he thought, you know, I, have, I live in this tremendous palace and it really doesn't reflect the greatness of God like it really, I want it to, like it needs to. And so he had it in his heart to build an elaborate structure. He knew it wouldn't house God, but in the old economy, in the Old Testament, God would meet in this particular place in a special way. God was there in what the uh, theologians call the Shekinah glory. We know that God is everywhere, is He not? God is everywhere. But his glory appeared in a particular place in the Old Testament. And that was in the most holy place where the ark was. And David wanted to construct a building that would house that place where the Shekinah glory of God would, would show up and be provided. And he said, I had in my heart to build a house as a place of well, the rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God. And I made plans to build it. But God said to me, you're not to build a house for my name because you're a warrior and have shed innocent blood. And then he went on to say, he said to me, Solomon, your son is the one who will build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son and I will be his father. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the portico of the temple. He gave him the plans for all that the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all of those things that would be utilized in the ministry and service there. Now I want us to turn and look at, that was found in uh, second in First Chronicles chapter 28, but I want us to look at chapter 29. And let's read together. It says, then King David said to the whole assembly, my son Solomon, and by the way, David is, is an older guy now. In fact, this is going to be one of his last responsibilities as the king of Israel. He said, my son, the one whom God has chosen is young and inexperienced and the task is great because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. With all my resources, I have provided for the temple of my God. Gold for the wor gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for bronze, iron for the iron, and wood for wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stone and marble, all of these in large quantities. Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God over and above everything I have provided for this holy temple. And it lists in the next few verses, actually uh, in today's economy, it would have been about $35 million worth of stuff. Okay. And then he says in verse 5, Now, who is willing to consecrate himself today to the Lord? Then the leaders of families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds and officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. They gave toward the work on the temple of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, 
and a hundred thousand talents of iron. Any who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord in custody of Jehaliel the Gershonite. And the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. And David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are aliens and strangers in your sight as were all our forefathers. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Our Lord, our God. As for all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name, it comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things have I given willingly with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willing your people are, who are, who have given to you. O Lord, God, fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this desire in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commandment, requirements, and decrees, and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I provided. Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed low and fell prostrate before the Lord and the king. Notice that David says in the very first verse, The task is great. The task is great. Now, while we're thinking about this, you're thinking, well, well, Pastor, I'm not sure how the fact of this this Old Testament temple, how does that have a relationship to us? You You know where the temple of God is today? Your body is the temple of the Lord if you're a Christian. The Holy Spirit resides there. And did you know the Bible also says that the church is the temple of the Lord. And so I think we can draw this kind of relationship. But the task is great. It is great because of it is a palatial structure. It is called here. A palatial structure that will require numerous resources, skills, and helpers. That was true in the construction of the temple, the Old Testament temple, but it is also true in the construction of God's temple today, his people. It requires resources, skills, and helpers. But it is also great because it is not for man, but for the Lord God. You see, we're not, God's people, the church of the living God, isn't building something for themselves. It's building something for God. Is building something that would honor him, that would glorify him. I want you to notice these things in David's appeal for the people to share in this effort of building the temple. First of all, his appeal was, now who is willing? In other words, it's voluntary. It's voluntary. But it also required devotion because he says in verse 5, willing to consecrate. Consecrate. That consecration means there's there's devotion. There's consistency involved in consecrating. Something devoting something to the Lord. But you know, it's interesting because he didn't say consecrate your stuff, but 
He made this appeal personal. Who is willing to consecrate himself? Himself. Do you know if, if God has my heart and has your heart, he's got my wallet too. If God has my heart and your heart, he has your family too. If God has my heart and your heart, He has the way you work and live your life too. That is a consecration of ourselves to God. But notice this appeal is very focused. He didn't say, well, you know, let's do this so we can have a really, a really elaborate structure. No, He said, let's do this to the Lord, to the Lord. You know, we're, we're really blessed to have a nice facility here to worship the Lord, aren't we? Yes, we're very, we're very fortunate to have that. But let me tell you something. What we're more fortunate to have is the Lord in our hearts. Because this building will one day decay, but the Lord's temple will last forever. And you and I, we need to be building, helping the Lord build that temple to the glory of His name. We're not out here to make, quote, the congregation of Christ's chapel something super duper. What we're here to do is to honor the Lord who came down from heaven and hung on a cross and died for our sins, who rose again the third day And who has been patient with all of us, with all of us, through all of our fumbling and mumbling and grumbling. He's been patient with us. And we ought to be grateful to Him. And we ought to be willing to join in and focus our attention upon His glory, upon the Lord. And notice that He says, now who is willing to consecrate Himself to the Lord? But there's another word in between that. Today, today. In other words, it's an, an immediate appeal. Some people say, well, you know, I, 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 know I, I know I'm a sinner and I know I need to give my life to Jesus and I know that, that he died for my sins and I believe that. But one of these days, one of these days, David said, no, today. And isn't that what the scripture says? The scripture says today is the day of salvation. Today. Now is the accepted time, the Bible says. Today. And so David's appeal again was it was voluntary. Who is willing? You see, God is looking for, not for somebody to twist your arm. God is wanting to nudge your heart toward Him. Nudge your desire to be what He wants you to be. Nudge your heart to be grateful for what He has done and is doing in your behalf. Now what would motivate believers like these to give so generously as they did? What would be their motivation? Well, David's praise and prayer really provides some key truths about giving and gratitude of ourselves. First, in verse 11 of chapter 29, listen to what he's he's praying. He says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. And so first David reminds us that everything in heaven and on earth belongs to God. Now, I think sometimes we imagine that up in here, but we really don't process what that really means. The applications of that reality. God owns everything. In Psalm 24 and 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world, and get this, and all who live 
in it. Job 41 and 11 says, who has a claim against me? And this is the Lord speaking. He says, who has a claim against me that I must pay? In other words, what does God owe any of us? You say, oh, well, you know, I, I don't think he owes us. Oh, yeah, you do. Sometimes you do. Because something didn't happen that you thought ought to happen your way, and it didn't happen that way. And so what happened with you? You got mad at God. God, you failed me. You didn't give me this. You didn't let that happen. You, you, you know, I needed this job. I wanted this job, and I didn't get that job, and so on and so forth. We came up with all kinds of things, and we blame God. We accuse God. But let me tell you something. God doesn't owe you anything. Because he owns you. Everything under the sun belongs to me, God says. In Job 41.11. Then in Colossians 1.16, the Apostle Paul reminds the Colossian church about the Lord Jesus. He said, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. For him. Not for me, not for you, for him. So another, another motivation for good stewardship. A second thing is mentioned in verse 12. We're told that wealth and honor come from hard work. A lucky streak? No, wealth and honor come from God. Everything comes from you, verses 14 through 16 says. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. As I was preparing this message, I came across, I think, a tremendous illustration that brings it home to all of us. I think all of us, especially if you're a parent You can get this. Dr. Tony Evans really provides us a good illustration. And I quote, he said, when my children were young, there were times when they would ask for money so they could help buy me a birthday present. You ever had that experience? You know, kid doesn't have any, he doesn't have any income. So they come and said, dad or mom says, you know, can I have some money? Well, all you need says, well, your birthday's coming up or Mother's Day's coming up or whatever, you know, okay? What they didn't realize what they, that they needed me to bless me. Did you get that? They needed me, he says, to bless me. We need God to be able to bless him. You know why? Because he owns everything. Everything is his. And what we have or possess belongs to Him and we have to ask Him to help us bless Him. And He goes on to say, but you see, I wasn't any better off having received a present that I paid for. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, we did this for God and so on and so forth. And maybe that was your motive. But you didn't improve God any. What you did was you improved yourself. When you do things for the Lord, you're just improving your own life. Because God is already God. And we can't make Him any better than He always has been and always will be. So what was meaningful to me, Dr. Evans says, was that my kids wanted to bless me out of their hearts of love for me. That's what God wants. God wants your heart. God wants you to love Him. Because He loves you. And He doesn't mind giving you what you need. Ray Pritchard in a message that I read at one time called The Forgotten Secret of Christian Giving told of this conversation. Listen to it carefully. He said the late Bishop Edwin Hughes once delivered a rousing sermon on, quote, God's ownership. 
that put a rich parishioner's nose out of joint. Now let's stop. I don't want you to miss this. Some of you may be very literal in your thinking. But if you could imagine somebody punching you in the nose and putting you out of joint. In other words, that would not be a pleasant experience, right? It wouldn't for me. But this message on God's ownership put this very wealthy parishioner's nose out of joint. In other words, he didn't like it. And so this wealthy man took Bishop out for lunch and then he, and he took him to his home and he walked him through his elaborate gardens, woodlands, and farm. And then he asked this. Now are you going to tell me that all this land does not belong to me. Mr. Hughes just smiled and replied, ask me that same question a hundred years from now. You get the point? You get the point. What you think you own, you really don't. You're just using it because God is letting you use it. And that means you're a steward. And you're a manager. But know that good stewards are grateful and generous. Knowing that one, God owns everything. Listen, if you don't, if you don't re remember anything about this, remember, God owns everything. Whatever you have, and I'm not talking about just possessions, I'm talking about your abilities, your talents, your gifts, your time, and all really is owned by God. Secondly, God enables us to have something to give. Just like Dr. Evans' little kids, Daddy, we, we need some money so we can buy you a birthday present. We need God to bless God. But there's another important thing that I'm afraid that many people do not do and do not realize. Oh, they, they say, yeah, I believe that. God can be trusted to care for us as we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Didn't Jesus say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things, everything we need will be added to you. But a lot of people don't believe that. That's why they don't give what they could give to the church. And giving to the church is not simply giving to the church, it's giving to the Lord so His ministry can be done. God can be trusted to care for us as we seek first His kingdom and righteousness. God deserves and demands good stewardship. You see, stewardship is not optional. Everyone is a steward. As Dr. J. Duncan III aptly stated, whether you're four or 94, whether you're a wealthy professional or whether you're a ditch digger, whether you're an adult or a child, a man or a woman, no matter what you are in this congregation, no matter what else you are, you are a steward. And your life, now listen to this, your life is either oriented in serving the true God as a steward or it is oriented towards serving a false God that you have set up in your heart, whatever it is, whoever it is. As we hinted at earlier, God wants you, not merely your stuff. He wants you to consecrate yourself, to give yourself, not because a preacher begs you to or a congregation begs you to, but because that's what people, that's what good stewards do. They know God owns everything 
And they know that everything they have, God has given to them and is responsible to manage them to his glory and to the good of his creation. He wants you not only to consecrate yourself, he wants you to do so willfully, wholeheartedly, gratefully, and joyfully. He wants more than the money in your possession. Christ wants your life. He wants you assisting in the ministries of the local church and sharing in other personal endeavors. Romans 12, 1 and 2, if you've never memorized any scriptures, memorize those scriptures. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's so important, so important that we become living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service or worship. Not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Learn it. Put it into practice. Now Paul, and I want to close with Paul's guidelines for giving. He wrote to the Corinthian church at least three times and the Holy Spirit inspired two of those letters to be placed in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. Paul says this, Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. In other words, he is, he is saying, this is a principle of giving. I've told this other congregation this already and I'm sharing it with you. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Okay, let's, let's break that down. Number one, each one of you in other words, he doesn't say, well, some of you. He says, each one of you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Corinthian church. He's talking to the people of the church. He says, each one of you should set aside a sum of money. Okay, so that's personal giving. It is planned giving. It is persistent giving. And it is giving in keeping with your potential. What you can give. You see, all of us can't give the same amount. You know why? Because we don't all have the same amount. God hasn't given all of us the same amount. but in keeping with our income. You remember when Jesus was standing and watching people throw in offerings into the treasury. And there was a lot of wealthy people who came by and they were tossing in a lot of money. And there was a widow, a widow. And all she had was a couple of cents. And it was just a meager... Really, she and she just she didn't say, "Well, you know, I'm going to wait till I have more." No, she came and she put in what she had. And you know what Jesus said? Oh, now compared to what everybody else was throwing in 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 cash money, there wasn't there was no comparison. But to Jesus, she had put in more than everybody else. You know why? Because she put, she sacrificed. Romans 12 and 1. Let us be a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. She put in because she loved the Lord. She didn't put in to make an impression on somebody else. You know, she didn't have, you know, pull out a, a large wad out of her wallet or watch, say, hey, Look at me, look at me. I'm going to write this check out. Now, she put in 
what God had allowed her to have in her possession. I remember hearing a story about a man that he was very, really really almost impoverished, needed a job, and so he was he was a part of a congregation and he asked that congregation to come to the altar and pray for him to, to get a good business going. He was really struggling. And you know, God answered those prayers and his business began to grow. And I mean he was he was uh, and he was tithing. He was really tithing, giving and, and going above his tithe and giving. And his his business continued to grow and to grow and to grow until finally he said, Preacher, got the preacher off the side, says, Man, I says, I, I just I just can't afford to give anymore. In other words, he was given so much and he he wasn't he was making much more. He had a lot more to give. His business was doing so well. He says, Preacher, he said, Would you uh would you would you would you pray with me about this? The preacher said, Yeah, so they knelt down at the altar. And the preacher said, Lord, brother so-and-so here, he says, he's making too much money that he can't cheerfully give his portion to you anymore. So Lord, would you, would you reduce his business so that he's comfortable in giving like he used to be? He said, wait a minute, preacher, not that. (laughs) Listen, folks, what's your potential? What's your potential? A lot of times when we think, for example, and and it's not just this congregation, but other congregations as well, we think, well, is the church going to pay for that? You know who the church is? You are. You're it. A lot of times we say, well, is the government going to pay for that? You know who the government is? You know where they get their money? You're it. I believe in every congregation who loves the Lord Jesus that whatever that congregation, whatever God wants that congregation to have, they can have it if people Remember who owns it, where it comes from, and do it for His glory. Every congregation of people who love Jesus, that's the truth. But we have to trust Him, don't we? Say, oh, I can't afford it. I can't afford it. Listen, folks, He'll give it to you. But you've got to give Him your heart. You've got to give Him your heart. You've got to want to. You've got desire. You can come say, Lord, you know, I'm struggling. He says, yeah, I know that. But I'm here to help you. And He will. He does. He does. And then Paul, he, he, he had to write this same church's second letter. Apparently they weren't very thrifty or quick about doing what he had mentioned in the first letter. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, he said this, Remember, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. In other words, don't wait till the preacher has to pound you and pound you. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Did we get that, folks? That means, Jay, you don't have an excuse. You don't have an excuse. 
And I want to close with the question we opened with. Having listened to God's word, having understood it, are you a good steward? Are you a good steward? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you today, Father, Lord, help us. Help us to have the desire to honor you, to glorify you. And Lord, we know that your glory, your glory, will bring joy to the hearts of those who trust you. And Father, as we bow before you, I pray that even now you're speaking to our hearts and, and perhaps, Lord, because it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not just about money, Lord. We know this. But what about our time? That belongs to you too. What about our abilities, our talents, our gifts? Are we seeking to bless you with those things you have given us? God, help us. Help us. To have the desire we need to have. The willingness. The commitment. The constancy. And Father, I ask this in your name. Amen.